OK, this week's Talking Points now with Maddie Playle. Right, Cheveley Park are the latest owners to be cutting back their string by 20%, which in their case is quite a lot of horses. Yet, they're spending several million pounds, I would conjecture, on this elite string of jumpers, where there really isn't ever any question of getting a financial return. So, Maddie Plough, what do you make of that? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I mean, 20% is a, is a big number, and you've seen other owners not exit the scene, but John Dance, Trevor Hemmings, um, you know, really big, important owners to us. And it doesn't seem like Cheveley Park are, are going to stop with their sort of elite brand of national hunt horses. Not but when they're running like this. No, they can't seem to buy a bad horse, can they? So, um, you know, they're responsible for some of the really leading lights in the, in the jumps game at the minute. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely not good news, but equally, you can understand why these people are making these decisions. Mm. But it's a curious juxtaposition, isn't it? Because one's a business decision saying we're not getting quite the return back given the difficult state of the market, given the economy, given the sales, and you quite understand that. But on the other hand, exactly the same group of people is spending lots of money, millions of pounds, on something that is purely for pleasure. Yeah. Of which there is no business. Yeah, and you, you look at a horse like Envoy Allen, what is he now, nine from nine, is he ever going to recoup that? How much was it? Four hundred thousand well, they spent he, on him. He might, he might well do, but mm. in prize money, in in due course. But it's yeah. not. That's not what's driving the. That's what's not no. what's driving their jumping interest, is it? It's pure pleasure. Yeah, exactly. And that that you know, is it, it's not hard to see why when they've got the caliber of horses that they have. Um, yeah. So that that the, I suppose the point I'm making is. Is it that the big operations on the flat they need they need to feel a return? But over jumps, frankly, you could. You could run these horses for next to nothing and mm. people are just doing it for, for fun anyway. Yeah, what does that say about the, the love of jump racing? Um, but equally, the flat is sort of, you know, they've got some amazing stallions as well, but with the jump mm. games, of course, you don't get that, that same income afterwards. No, it's, a, it's, an, it's certainly an interesting juxtaposition. They have got some wonderful horses. Envoy and I think, could be one of the best we've seen in, in many a year, and he was absolutely superb the other day. There is, of course, a new COVID ownership strategy that was posted this week by, uh, by the ROA and we are about to get a, a, an ownership strategy that has been longer in the making come out, come out this week to, to retain and promote ownership within the sport. And there's been some criticism as well, hasn't there, of, uh, uh, of the Racehorse Owners, for, Racehorse Owners Association for not getting this out sooner, Maddie. But what do you think the key, the key messages are to get out there now in order to, in order to keep people's interest and get people buying horses? Yeah, I think the, you know, the, the goals they have are admirable and they're the right goals to have. But I also think that criticism is fair. And one thing to say is in a large amount of that action plan for COVID that they've got, not a lot of their goals have time scales and are really all that measurable. Um, what I would say, though, is owners are obviously absolutely integral to the sport. I mean, what's the return on a one pound investment? Isn't it seven pence or something like that? Um, and going forward, you know, we'll talk about the sales in a bit and the sales results have largely been positive thanks to a few. Is that sustainable going forward? I know in the new year they've got a uh, campaign with Great British Racing on um, mm. syndicates yeah. and that's, you know, excellent. Definitely that's the, the direction that we need to go in following the likes of Australia, etc. Um, but, yeah, I think um, it's definitely not... <laughs> It, it's but sort of there's I, a lot of similarities with with their six point plan to the BHA's let, nine let, point plan. Let me ask you this: let's let's actually make this real rather than rather than you know, something that's completely abstract. You've been in syndicates, you've had small shares in horses. If somebody offered you a small share in a horse now, would you take it? This is the thing. We've actually, um, I think, this morning there was a piece gone up on uh, Midland Park and about how people are ringing up and and wanting shares left, right and centre because everyone's stuck at home with nothing to do. So it is almost a golden opportunity it's interesting. if it can work, which is great that we have something to be positive about. And, I mean, I don't want people to be ringing my phone endlessly, but, yeah, of course, it gives you that insight that you don't get. And I think, you know, it will force people to innovate when it comes to ownership. You know, soon there might be cameras in stables, live cameras on Gallup. So it, it's exciting as much as it is worrying. Mm. OK, let's uh, talk about uh, the betting landscape. I mean, Nick Rust mentioned at the beginning of the program how, how much money quite the sport's going to lose from betting shops being closed for the next month. We're not absolutely sure, either in terms of uh, media rights or, or levy. 
Um, what we do now, however, is that Labricks and Corals are no longer in the betting ring. Is this something that we need to, the sport needs to worry about, the fact that Labricks and Corals aren't in the betting ring, or is it just a natural consequence of, of the passage of time? I think it is a natural consequence. Obviously, a lot of people associate that betting ring. It's a, it's a real heritage and a real selling point for, for racing fans, isn't it? But it isn't what it was, and I think the fact they describe the, the you know, games as marginal, um, it's just a natural consequence, sadly. Um, and that's the way it's going with online betting and, uh, you know, betting abroad. But, you know, the bookmakers are really, really struggling right now. Not only were they closed, obviously, in the tiered system, but now with a lockdown as well. Um, this is going to hit them hard. Well, which means it'll hit the sport hard as well. I mean, I think there's two things to consider here as well, insofar as that, first of all, the fact that um, starting prices are likely as not never to be formulated again on course it disincentivizes those operations from having from having presence on course or in the betting ring on course at any rate. And the, the second thing to consider, I, which was very interesting, I was talking to John Hooper from Sid Hooper, who bought all yeah. these pitches earlier in the week, and he was saying that, well, he's just bought them at the bottom of the market, and he thinks that come next year he'll be able to offload some of them at a tidy profit, which is uh, an interesting sort of glass half full interpretation. Interesting, yeah, and I think optimistic, um, because they did say that the selling wasn't directly linked to COVID. Obviously, that had some sort of contributing factors, but it was more just the way that the, the industry and the business was going. Um, but, you know, brilliant that you can be optimistic and, and hopefully, you know, when we do get people eventually back on race courses, that sort of you know, um, character of the mm. betting ring will return. But in order for him to sell on, move on those pitches, he needs a, a decent enough um, body of bookmakers to still be in business. And if this, if we're, how many more lockdowns we, we, we get, the, the likelihood of losing loads more is, is significant, I would have thought. Definitely. Um, I mean, it's worrying times for everyone at the moment. And I think we still don't know the extent of to what's going to happen and how hard things are going to hit, but it's been such a long time now and I think we all know it's, it's not good news. OK. Let's talk about uh, Jim Bolger's comments in the Irish field this week, which were replicated in today's Racing Post. Uh, just pray see this. Jim was in, in conversation and was, was asked about, uh, suggested that there was a an underlying issue in Ireland specifically because he said he didn't want to comment on the rest of the world because it wasn't his place to in Ireland specifically with um, illegal substances that were being used that shouldn't be used and clearly weren't showing up in in tests he didn't put that much more meat on the bones but that's enough for a senior trainer to suggest the testing system in Ireland one of the world's most important thoroughbred nations is not sufficient and that, as, to use his words we are not playing on a level playing yeah. pitch, he said. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean... <laughs> yes, massive, massive, isn't it? Very, very punchy story. Um, and I think he was demanding for more quantity in testing, but crucially out of competition, as you say, because a lot of tests are happening and they're just not doing it in the right way to detect, you know, however people are supposedly getting around it, but also different types of testing. So hair testing, he said he wouldn't mind if anyone came into his yard at any one time and tested any of his, his horses. And, I mean, that's an environment that we would like to have, isn't it? But um, alarming, alarming, I would say. Uh, clearly, um, out-of-competition testing is, a, is an important, would be an important development. So horses not just being tested within the trainer's yards, but also when they're in, in pre-training yards, and this has mm -hmm. been talked of. The problem is that it's very difficult for either the Irish Horse, Horse Racing Regulatory Board or the British Horse Racing Authority to track where these horses exactly are going when they're out of training, even though there have been numerous efforts to do so. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we know the success of, of all the pre-training yards and, and, you know, satellite yards and different yards that these horses go to. Um, so I guess that's that's easy to understand why Jim's made these, these comments. But as a trainer with his stature to come out with this in such a strong way, um, it doesn't paint a particularly great picture. Well, it does, it does shake your faith in the overarching integrity absolutely. of the sport, doesn't absolutely. it? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And as you say, he was only commenting on, on Ireland, but it is something that we're seeing in racing globally. I mean, you look at Jason Service and Maximum Security in the Saudi Cup. You look at in Australia, I know it wasn't to do with drug testing, but Darren Weir with the, the jiggers, it obviously took a long time for them to undercover that. So it's a big issue that racing needs to really get on top of. Yeah, that's Jim, Jim Bolger, who was giving an interview to the Irish Field yesterday.
and it'll be um, fascinating to follow the, the trajectory of that. Let's talk about the horses in training sales results, which in some cases were, were good. And, and we had a, a record setter in English King at 925,000 guineas bound for the Moroni team in Australia. And I think they knew that what kind of money they were going to have to give and they were quite happy to give it. Again, I'll ask you the similar sort of question, Maddie. Is it, a, is it a worry that a horse like English King is leaving these shores for an Odin breeder in Bjorn Nielsen who's, who, who puts so much into the game here? Definitely. Of course it is, and it's indicative of our prize money as well. Australia, you know, their prize money's fantastic, I'm well, sure. They'll win we'll... that back in one hit if they yeah. get the race right. <laughs> we'll talk about the Melbourne Cup in, uh, in just a minute, but uh, I think the... The res speaking to a lot of the people who work in our, our bloodstock areas, I, I think the results were relatively positive. But then, as I said earlier on in the show, if you think about the few, the elite who are propping it up, mm. is that sustainable? And again, that links to the syndicates and the importance of making horse race, uh, horse ownership, you know, affordable and a good enough experience for, for lots of different people to get involved in. Oh, interestingly, I was talking to Chris Dixon yesterday, who, with his brother Martin, was buying horses for their syndicates at the sales, and they were saying that they could get the horses that they wanted, the, the sort of what they would call the lower middle end of the market, significantly less expensively than they were able to, able to last year. That's interesting. I'm mm. worrying for anyone who's coming up against one of their horses. <laughs> Such a shrewd outfit. Well, it's good and it's bad, isn't it? On one sense, you want the market to be buoyant and strong yeah. and you want the trade to be good. But on the other hand, as you say, at the moment, if you or I can get an opportunity to get into to horses like that and get involved in these syndicates like theirs or Nick Bradley's or Midland Park or... Yeah, there are so many out there, I'm not favouring one over the other. <laughs> but there are so many good outfits now that run really well, then, yeah. then so much the better if we can get in affordably. Yeah. Exactly, and I think if you look, just going back to English King and that sale, it'd be interesting to see how he does in Australia, but obviously I feel like there's an unfinished business and it's such a shame that we can't keep these horses, but at the same time, again, economically, it doesn't really make much sense, does it? But if Sir Dragon is winning a Caulfield Cup and is going <laughs> to... Don't. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It, it's, well, how much are these horses really worth? Maybe 925 grand was a bargain. Mm -hmm. Perhaps, perhaps. You know, it's got to work out, the horse has got to stay sound and, and adapt to conditions, but he's going to the right place and there's no reason to think he shouldn't. Now, I'm sure you will have had a good, good look at the Melbourne Cup, so who's going to win it? I'm going to be really boring and I, I just jump on the Tiger Moth bandwagon. Mm -hmm. I think he's, he's just the perfect horse for the race and he's got that high class form, he's a young up and coming horse. And um, it's a race I love, I mean we all love it, don't we, but it, it's such a, a fascinating affair. And, and this year, there's, you know, you look at a horse like Very Elegant, what she's done, um, that a day form didn't work out too badly, did it? No. <laughs> um, and, yeah, there's so many, obviously, British and Irish representatives now over there, with, whether they're with their same trainers or whether they've been moved along, but it's fascinating to see a horse like Sir Dragon a go and win um, big prize over there. And it seems, for whatever reason, we just have that middle distance sort of to stay as... Um, division, we're very strong compared to those Aussies, whereas well, their sprinters are probably stronger. We are at the moment, but if the migration continues, this is the other point mm. about um, English King Sale, yeah, the horse is still a full horse. If the migration continues, where, where is the tipping point where actually all these horses then become bred in Australia and we're no longer just an export service? Mm. We, we become an irrelevance, yeah. in fact. Huh? And so, and so many it, of our, our stallions Where are we, half a generation away from, from that? I mean, we're, yeah, we're now looking possibly. at Magic One's going to be covered by Justify on Australian time. Her foal will be born as an Australian. Yeah, yeah. And that's the, the global appeal of racing, isn't it? It's, it's why it's so hard to be sort of um, only follow one jurisdiction because it's all so wonderfully interconnected. But as you say, it's worrying for, for us um, to see all that outsourced... Um, to Australia. A lot of those horses as well sold to the Middle East in the horses in training sales mm. and um, yeah, it's, um, I think it's reflective of just a sign of the times really and, and prize money. Mm. And that, it all comes, all comes back to that prize money at that, that very top end and if there isn't enough of it and we can't compete with the rest of the world then you know, you, it's not hard to see what scenarios uh, might unfold as we talk about the Breeders' Cup at Keeneland in Kentucky, which will take place on Friday and Saturday. The weather forecast is reasonably fair for this week in Kentucky. I don't want to get carried away because you never know, it can change from one day to the next, but um, that should mean that the ground is just on the good side, maybe a little quicker. 
Um, Maddie, there's a very, very big group of European horses going over. I mean, given the circumstances we're in, given we're about to enter a lockdown, given the pandemic this year, it's amazing how many horses are going and a great, a great effort on everyone's part to get them there. Exactly, and it's really important going forward. I mean, you look at Hong Kong, it'll be interesting to see how many horses turn up there. Mm. Um, obviously, the, the carnival is well underway in, in Australia, but a lot of the horses then go on afterwards to, to stay, don't they? But um, Breeders' Cup, yeah, one, I mean, this is your your area of expertise, but one horse who I've had my eye on for it for quite a while is New Mandate. Mm. He's sort of come out of nowhere, really. Obviously, he'll be running in the juvenile turf, but his form's worked out probably better than some people would have been anticipating. And I just think he, he's a real speed. He's got that cruising speed. He's, you know, not overly big. It's not going to take him too much effort to get you know, into a good position, and I think he could surprise, maybe. Yeah, I, I think he's got a good chance. He's also got Frankie Desori. What's your number one bet? What, what's your number one fancy? I think Tanawa in the turf. Yes, I, I was desperate to see her to go to Hong Kong, actually, because mm. I think it would suit her a lot over there. But she's brilliant, isn't she? Right at the top of her game. And there aren't many um, fillies who've won the turf. Pebbles did it, obviously, very early on in, in 84. Five, I think it was at, at Aqueduct but you know, after that there weren't many fillies who won the turf and then we've had found and enable oh, and I yeah. think Tanawa's got a great chance going back to your point even though the fillies race is there the fillies race at a mile and three sixteenths so just north of a mile and a furlong is not going to be far enough for a horse like Tanawa so I think mm. she's Dermot Wells said she's his best chance he reckons he's ever had in it in a breeder's cup strong words aren't they mm. I think it's, it's just fascinating to see how you say there's a big contingent and it'll be fascinating to see how they get on once again because our style of racing is so different mm. and conditions there are so different as you you would know more about but it's great to see which horses can adapt and which horses can't yeah i mean the fact that they're all getting there is is one good thing but of course the horses are used to it the horses are used to quarantine and biosecurity measures mm. and having the vet checks and having all their all their tests done so it's a, yeah. it's no real different of course they don't have covid and no crowds as well which is uh, going to continue for some time unfortunately i'm afraid it is um thank you very much money those were this week's talking points